together as God's people, and if you needed coffee before the service, you don't anymore after that song. Amen. That was great. Um, you know, oftentimes, um, when we think about confession, we think about the places where we've made mistakes, where we've messed up, where we've fallen short, and where we've done things that have hurt the people that we love. Uh, but confession is more than that. God has a, a vision for your life a way that he wants to transform you to make you the person that he's designed you to be for the blessing of your spouse, for the blessing of your children, for the blessing of the places that you work. And so as we confess in this upcoming song, we confess that sometimes we hold back from God. We hold on to pieces and parts of our lives where we don't want to let him have his way with us. And so during this song, we come before God in confession and say, Lord, here's, here's my life. Make what you will of it to make me who you want to be so that others would be blessed through me and see your love and your grace in me.
this morning we make this song our prayer as we confess before the Lord. Take all. We sing. surrender we sing Savior. And so this morning, Father, we come at the foot of the cross, knowing that on an account of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your power at work in me. I'm broken gracefully. I'm strong when I am weak. I will be free.
our battle cry this morning. We rejoice together. We sing a hallelujah. i uh-huh. 
lift a hallelujah. We rejoice because the king is alive. And so we are alive in you. In Jesus' name we pray, we say together, amen. Please be seated at this time. And the kids are going to come up for a children's message with our one and only Pastor Brad. Come on down, kiddos. Come on down. So, you know, I, I sing a hallelujah. You know what the word hallelujah means? It's from the Hebrew. It means halal and yah. It means praise the Lord. So in the storm, we're singing praise the Lord. When God does great things in our life, we're singing praise the Lord. Our every response we have is praise the Lord because he is who he is and we are who we are and he saved us and we're his. That's an awesome song. Sometimes you don't think about what hallelujah means. It means praise the Lord. So in every instance, we can praise God because he's always with us. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Hey, guys, I'm glad you're here. Um, so I, I got a loaf of bread with me, and, and it's a great loaf of bread. Man, it smells good. Here, you want to smell it? Doesn't that smell good? You want to smell it? Yeah, doesn't that smell good? Here, here. Yeah, I, 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 I'll tell you, dude, I'm going home today. I'm eating this, yeah. Yeah, it, it's a great loaf of bread. Oh, man, and, and, I, and I, it tastes so good. Yeah, you want to smell it? There you go, yeah. Tastes really good. Yeah, all right, yeah. Um, so I got a loaf of bread, and I got a can of tuna fish. I don't know if you like tuna fish or not, but I like it because it's in water, and I, I just grew up like, liking fish. So I got a loaf of bread and a can of tuna fish. You think I could feed all of us? Yeah. Oh, no, that would be like too many. How about if I try to feed everybody here? Yeah. Hmm. You know, today Jesus tells a story, or we get the story about Jesus, rather, I should say, that Jesus fed not only this many people, but like the number of people who would worship in this service for a year. You know how long a year is? From one Christmas till the next Christmas. That whole time, that's how big the crowd was. Yes. It was whole Christmas. That's right. The whole, <laughs> a whole year, a whole Christmas. And he had five of these, and he had two fish. We'll say two cans of tuna fish, all right, because I didn't want to bring the stinky fish up. Yeah, yeah. So he had five loaves, and, 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 and the disciples said, you can't do that. And he says, you guys give them something to eat. And, 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 and they said, no, no, we can't do that. And he says, what do you got? And he says, we, they got five loaves and two fishes, and Jesus blessed them. And they started giving out the bread, and they started giving out the fish, and it just kept coming. It just kept coming, and they fed everybody, and the Bible says, and everybody was full. It's like having a great meal and having a great dessert, and you go, oh, man, that was good. Everybody was satisfied and full, and they collected 12 basketfuls that were left over. Wow. Jesus, when he feeds us, he feeds everybody, and everybody's full. And this is what he wanted us to learn. When he tells us to love one another and love each other, and we say, man, we don't have what it takes to help people. He says, what do you got? And we say, oh, man, we got a loaf of bread and tuna fish. He says, use it, and I'll help you get more. And you'll be able to bless everybody around you because I'm with you. Would you say this with me? Love one another as I have loved you. One, two, three. Love, love one another as I have loved you. you. And Jesus promises to be with us and work miracles through us to love people in his name. Isn't that cool stuff? Well, would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, thank you for this story. Help us to always remember that when you ask us to love people, you're always there and you always give us what we need. We pray in your name. Amen. Okay, we got Children's Church and the high school folks. We're going to release you guys as well. They, they kind of go through uh, the message and talk about it uh, in real time uh, where they're at. So we'll release all you guys, and uh, you can get started. Okay, okay, good. No, you don't get this for communion. I'm taking it home. Yeah. All right, I'm Brad. If you didn't know, I'm, I'm one of the pastors here. I get to, to be on mission with you all and with Pastor Nathan. Uh, it's, it's such a privilege, and it's great to be with you today. Uh, welcome to each of you who are uh, with us in this flesh and blood reality. And each of you are with us online. God is not bound by space and time. Yeah, his spirit is with us, and his spirit is with you. And through these words that we speak, through his word in, in the Bible, his spirit comes. It's never just bare and naked. It's always in the power of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And so I, I know that God's spirit will touch your heart and mine and give you his blessings. And we pray that God would give us such a trust, such a faith to receive that. 
uh, in, in our lives today. Uh, we're uh, looking at this uh, book of Mark. Uh, we call it Life with Jesus. We think this book is all about how we do life with Jesus. Uh, we call that a, a disciple, one who follows Jesus, right? Uh, and so how do we, and, and this is all about that. He calls his disciples and he's teaching them and showing them what it means. Uh, and because it was written down, it was written down for us. So he calls us into the story. So it's Life with Jesus. Uh, and today it's Mark chapter 6. Uh, and I, uh, the, the theme I gave this was remember who the real enemy is. Now, Hopefully you've read this. Uh, uh, we invite you to do that and ask yourself those questions. Of, what is God saying to me here? I'm like, what am I gonna, supposed to do about it? Because after all, that's what Jesus said, right? right? He says, take my words and put it into practice, and then you'll be blessed. So it's not hear my words and sit on my tail. It's hear my words, put it into practice, and you'll be blessed. So hopefully you've done some of that. But if not, it's okay. You, you, you don't have to leave. You're in the right place. Because uh, we're going to look at this chapter, and you can go home and think about it. All right, what, what am I supposed to do here? Uh, but this is the theme Remember who the real enemy is. I got this uh, from, uh, there's this group of films that my children turned me on to uh, that I, I really like. It's called The Hunger Games. Anybody watch those a long time ago? Yeah. And, and in one of those uh, movies, this was a line. Remember who the real enemy is. And, and in this critical moment in the film, uh, the heroine, she's going to do something that uh, will tear down everything that she's about and everything that they're trying to accomplish. Uh, and, and, and this... This is called out to remember who the real enemy is. And with that, she gets things online again, and, 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 it goes, and, and everything goes great. So I, I was thinking about this because when I first started studying this chapter, I thought, well, this is part of what it's about, remember who the real enemy is. And then as I looked greater into the chapter, I think it, it entails more than just this. Go ahead. Remember who the real enemy is. You know, would you read these? One, two, three, the top one. Remember who the real enemy is. The second one, remember who Jesus is. And remember who you are. Those are the three, the, the, the triad. Uh, and, and it's all through this chapter. And, and as I was thinking about this, you know, if there were only two points, it, we plot it something like this, right? On a graph, you have the Y and the X. You guys remember math? I barely do. But anyway, so you got the Y and the X, and you, and you have a, a number value for each side, and you can plot a point. And, and, but the problem is that's not real life, right? It's only one-dimensional. Real life is never one-dimensional. And so it actually, in real life, it takes three points. Go ahead. And here's the three points. And inside that cube, that 3D cube of life, that flesh and blood reality, we find our place and we get centered as we answer these questions. Remember who the en real enemy is. Remember who Jesus is. And remember who you are. And this whole chapter, uh, it seems to me, is about that. Okay? Begins like this. Jesus left there. Uh, and went to his hometown. Now, remember the, the, the chapter before this, what had happened was that he uh, did these amazing things, right? He, he cast out the demons, a legion of demons from a dude, right? And, and, then he, um, and then he healed this woman that nobody could heal, and she'd spent all of her money, and, and he restored her honor, and, and, and then he raised a little girl from the dead. I mean, he did some great things, right? And so now he's going to his hometown, and notice he takes his disciples with him. It must be that he wants them to see something and experience something. And notice here, these words are written down. They weren't for his disciples. They'd already gone through this. They were for you. These words are written down so that we can experience what they did. All right, so, so Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. You know, as I'm reading through Mark and really all the Gospels, it amazes me that, how, that it always seems to start in Jesus preaching in the synagogue. In fact, there's one place in the gospel where it says this was his custom. Every Saturday, he was in worship. Every single Saturday, and he preached, and it all seemed to start from that place. And from, from time immemorial, God's people, one in seven, in the Sabbath, to worship. And, and, and I think that we, we overlook this to our own peril. Uh, we we um, certainly, um, we need to worship in spirit and in truth. If we're just a body of ba a bag full of water sitting here not doing anything and not engaged with our spirit, well, it doesn't do anybody any good. But, if we're, but, but, the, but God wants us here. God wants us rubbing shoulders with his people. God wants us in tune so his spirit can touch our hearts. You see, Jesus preaches still on the Sabbath as we come together one in seven, and he does great things and works great miracles, and everything seems to stem from that in these gospel accounts. It's the most amazing thing. So he's again in the synagogue, 
And many uh, were hearing him, and it's saying they were amazed. And we think, oh, yeah. They must remember what he did, you know, in the previous chapter, and uh, he must have had great words, and so they were just awed by him, right? No. They were amazed because he was kind of familiar to them. They kind of grew up with him. They said, where did this man get these things? I mean, this little Jesus, remember when he was two years old? Remember when he tried to play baseball? He was a lousy baseball player, you know? Uh, you know, he really wasn't very good in, in, in rabbinical school either. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, jo Joseph over here was a lot better than Jesus. Remember that? Yeah, and, and so they knew him. And they grew up with him, and they were tearing out, hey, we, we, what, isn't this the carpenter? I mean, he didn't, he's not even a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist, man. He's just a freaking carpenter. And we're supposed to listen to this guy. I mean, we grew up with him. That's what's going on here. And his, and his brothers and sisters, you know, they're not much of anything either. That's what they're thinking. And they took offense at him. So there's a saying, it, it goes like this. Familiarity breeds contempt. Where is Jesus too familiar to you? You know, it can happen real quick. All that Jesus stuff is kind of old hat. I am with you always. Yeah, but I don't know if you're there right now. I just don't think about you very often. huh? My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Yeah, but I don't like being weak. Take my words and put them into practice. Oh, you know what? I, I, I don't want to do that today. Where is Jesus too familiar to you? And then, on the other hand, where has this happened to you in your witness? I had a, a good friend of mine. I, I went to high school with him, and then we roomed in college for a number of years. Actually, I named my youngest child after him, uh, James. And uh, it's funny, my, my James always wants to be called James, and I call, always called this James Jim. But anyway, uh, uh, Jim, uh, he had this great father, and... Um, uh, when we were in high school and especially college, whenever I would connect with this guy and uh, I'd come over to his house and, and he, would, he would treat me like, um, like an adult. And he'd want to know about my life and he was very interested in what I said and he gave my words credence and we could sit and talk. And, and he never did that with his son. Now his son was just as responsible as I was, which means neither one of us is very responsible. I mean, come on, we were 18, 20, 29, whatever, you know, and neither one of us various, but, but he was, I wasn't any better than him, and yet his father couldn't see, couldn't see that, hey, my son is just like Brad. No, he just saw his son, and he couldn't break through that for the longest time. He was, his son was too familiar to him. Is anybody in your life like that? As you try, as you have a witness towards them, or on the other hand, as they try to speak into your life in witness, and you say, man, I, 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 I know you, man. I love the husband and wife thing. My wife knew all my warts, right? Man, it's hard to be a witness when somebody knows all your warts. Unless they receive you. And they know that, but they also know that Jesus is in you. Where do you struggle with that in your life? And then the idea of who the real enemy is. You see, Jesus didn't call down fire from, fire, fire from, from uh, heaven to, to crunch these guys, crispy crunchies. He didn't do that. Even though, even though it says that he was amazed by their lack of faith and that he couldn't do any miracles there except heal a few. Now, it wasn't because he didn't have the power. It's that faith is always the hand that receives. And there was no faith here to receive what, what Jesus would give them what the blessings he would give them. There, there was such unbelief that at one time, when in this same town, they tried to kill him. They tried to run him off a cliff, and he made himself invisible and walked uh, walk between them. Some would say it was this time, but that, that's kind of debated, you know, whether it was another time or this time. The point is, they, they, they were so shut off because he was so familiar to them, and they couldn't break through that. But Jesus doesn't munch him. He doesn't fry him. They're not the enemy. Where do you need to learn that in your life? Where are you making people the enemy instead of the evil one the enemy?
So Jesus then, he doesn't fry him. Uh, he just goes on to the next village. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. Do you see something new here? Do you see something that you've never seen in the book of Mark before? Up until this time, Jesus had proclaimed the good news. He had called people to repentance. He'd healed the sick. He'd cast out demons, but never the disciples. This is the first time, this is like a watershed reality that now he's sending the disciples out to do exactly what he did and he's giving them authority. The, the Greek word is exousia. It means this authoritative power he's giving to them. Now, now certainly in Mark 3 it says this. Uh, he called the 12 that they might be with him, spend some time with him, learn what it's all about, that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive out demons. So that, that was where they were going but this is the first time they did it. And what's interesting here is not at the end of his ministry. He's not doing Palm Sunday ne next week. This is very, he's still up in Galilee. He's not down in Judea. He's got a long ways to go in his ministry. These guys got a long time to be with Jesus yet. They have a lot of time they have to grow in, but he's sending them out already. You know, a lot of Christians say, man, well, I just need to be with Jesus for a while. I, I, I just need to be here before I, I before. no, 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 no. Jesus sends us out, baby. He sends us out because we can connect with people right away because we know what we've been rescued from. It goes on. This is what they did. They went out and preached that people should repent. Uh, repent. Metanoieo means to change your mind. So they, they proclaimed that God was with them, that Jesus brought the kingdom uh, they, 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 they offered this life in Jesus to change your mind and, and not walk away from a God, but receive what he would offer you, huh? They, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now, what we do with these words is we kind of dissect them. We're really good at that in the West, huh? We love to dissect stuff. We never stop to think sometimes that when you dissect something, you got to kill it. You ever notice? And so this is how we dissect this. We say, they went out and preached that people should repent. Well, we can do that, right? We can go out and, and, and we can show people Jesus. We can, we can proclaim what Jesus did for us on the cross. Mark had wonderful prayers where, where, he, where he embraced that, right? And, and, and every time we talk about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross and, and how we were created to have a relationship with God and, and the reason that we're empty inside so much and we're struggling so much and there's hurt and pain and brokenness in our world is because we walked away from that. But Jesus has come to connect us with God again. The Spirit of God touches our hearts. And he says, this is for you. Trust me on this. See, faith is not a hoop I jump through. It's a relationship I receive. Like, like getting married, I, I trust the promise of another. Right now, the words of Jesus, uh, his spirit is touching your heart and say, trust me on this. Maybe for the first time, maybe to strengthen you. But he's there. We can do this, we say. We can share Jesus with other people. And then this goes on and says, they drove out many demons. Well, we can't do that, right? Man, we don't even know what that looks like. How can we do that? So no, we'll chuck that one off. Uh, and anointed many sick people with oil. Oh, we can do that. You know, and, and you read these commentaries and they say, oh yeah, this is how they help sick people. They put this oil on their, on their wounds and so forth and they were healed. Oh, oh we, we, we can go to the doctor and heal them. Oh, well, you know, we can't heal them. So we, we kind of take this all apart. We even do it with the, the, the uh, Mark 3 that he might send them out to preach. We can do that and to have authority to drive out. Well, you know, we, we don't even know what that looks like, right? And so we, we kill this thing. This is what I really want you to get today. In the original language, there were no periods like this. It was a whole. It was one fabric. It went like this. They went out and preached that people should repent, comma, drove out many demons and, anoint, and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. It was... It was one fabric. You know, a lot of people, uh, 
I should do the other one too. Uh, and the second one, they went out uh, to preach. And then this word and, it's a Greek word, is chi. And, and lots of times it's used as and, but, but it, it can be used in many ways. I almost think here this is an, it was called an appositional chi. That is an equal sign that they, he might send them out to preach. That is to have authority to drive out demons. You see... It's all related to this powerful word of Jesus. You know, a lot of people ask me, they say, um, they they say, hey, well, can people, um, can can people be be, uh, um, taken over by Satan now? Can can they be possessed by Satan now? I say, absolutely. Absolutely they can. I say, and sometimes we don't see this. Sometimes we, um, sometimes uh, we we think that they're, they're sick in another way. And sometimes we don't see it. We just think they're doing evil stuff. I mean, think about some things that, that, that folks get tied into maybe in your life. Where you look back and you say, what got a hold of me? Whew. Satan is there, see. He can take hold of people. And, and we, when I was growing up, we had this movie. It was called The Exorcist. Anybody seen The Exorcist? You, you know what I'm talking about? All right, good. And, and, and I'll never forget this because it, 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 was, it was Hollywood, right? And, and so it had the, in order to throw out this demon, this guy had to do all of this pyrotechnic stuff and this strength that had to come from him and he had to do this great stuff. Whose authority did Jesus send them out in? His power. His authority. There's, um, there's a hymn written by a guy about 500 years ago, um, and, and, and it talks about that, that uh, though, though devils all the world should feel, all eager to devour us, they trem- we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. And at the end of that, the last line of that verse is, one word fells the evil one. And that word is the word of Christ. You see, this is all bound together in this word that he gives us. We go out and we share this word and and this word does all the work. There's a picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation and he's got this sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Sharp two-edged sword. It's a battle sword. And, and, And that sword is his word. So when we go out, we, 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 we go, the, these disciples and we, we go out in the authoritative power of Christ and as we speak his word, Satan and his demons are pushed back. We bring, we bring his truth into the hearts of many and we bring healing. You know, I don't think this is about how the ancients healed people at all, this anointing them with oil. I think this is pointing to the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, the prophets and the priests and the kings, when they were chosen by God, the the, the oil would be poured over their heads in it, and, and it signified the Spirit of God. We bring the Spirit of God through His Word, and it brings healing. Certainly, certainly use the healing of, of medicine. God, all wisdom comes from God, but we also bring the healing not simply of body, but of soul mind and a spirit and we do all these things through his wonderful word of love in Jesus Christ remember who the real enemy is it's not people we don't fight against flesh and blood we fight against the principalities of darkness Satan and his cohorts Remember who Jesus is, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who has won once and for all, who's crushed the head of Satan on the cross, risen again on Easter morning, and who continues in his ongoing work to redeem and restore all things. And remember who you are, a blood-bought, redeemed, empowered daughter or son of the Most High. We're blasting through the gates of hell in the power, the authoritative power of Jesus Christ as we take his word into the broken world and the broken lives around us. And yes, it begins with those who are close to us. Our husbands and our wives and our children and our grandchildren. 
And yes, it goes on farther and farther out. We remember who the real enemy is. We remember who Jesus is. We remember who we are. And we're plotted in 3D reality, flesh and blood reality in which we live. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. The same word, exousia, authoritative power, has been given me. And he sends us out to make disciples. And he closes this section with this, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is not simply for the 12. This is for me and for you. Not because we have great authority and power and wisdom, but because Christ sends us in his authority and power and wisdom with his words. Lots of times um, we think of Satan and we're afraid of him. We, and sometimes churches have taught people to be so frightened of Satan. And, and certainly we give him uh, respect like, a, uh, like an attack dog who's chained up. We, we ought to give him respect, right? And, and we, we love to quote this verse, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And, and we kind of say, well, let's just get in my little room and, and see if I can last till, 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 till I die or God comes, right? That's not what this is supposed to do to us. Look at this verse in James. It says, submit yourselves unto God. Resist the devil. Read the rest of it with me. And sound like somebody you got to be afraid of in the power of Jesus Christ? And even this section uh, in Peter, it ends like this. Christ will make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Christ will make you firm, uh, strong, and steadfast. We give Satan respect. But we're crashing the gates of hell. And in the authority and power of Christ, nothing can stand against us. We're bringing Jesus healing and his kingdom and his life and his power into this reality because he sends us and gives us the authority to do it. And that's what he did for the first disciples. And that's what they were doing. In the midst of all this, in the midst, <laughs> Mark, in the midst of this glorious reality of the disciples, casting out demons, healing people, calling people to repentance, bringing the kingdom, right? There's this great and glorious thing. Boom. He inserts the story of John the Baptist. This horrible story of, of Herod beheading John the Baptist. Of Herod wondering uh, who this Jesus is and saying, hey, wait, he must have come back from the dead. Of, of it seeming that evil had totally won. Why is this inserted? Because Mark is reminding us that this glorious reality is hidden in the cross. Jesus had total and complete victory on the cross. This emaciated, bleeding, dying, forsaken human being had complete victory in the cross. Revealed in the empty tomb. I think Mark is saying here, yeah, this is the great reality that you're about. But sometimes it's hidden. Beware of it. Remember who you are and who Jesus is and who the real enemy is. Don't get off kilter. And so he inserts this and then the story goes on. Here we go. The disciples gathered around Jesus and reported him all they had done and, and taught. Uh, uh, and, and he said, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So the disciples came to Jesus. They were excited. All this great stuff was happening. Man, look, what you're, look what's happening throughout. This is great. And, but we're so tired, man. Uh, uh, and, and, and Jesus said, great. Uh, c- come on, let, let's get some time. We'll rest. We'll deprogram. We'll have a great time together. And Jesus said, um, Jesus uh, sent them out. He sent them across the lake so they could find some time. Uh, and yet, they get to the other side and there's a large crowd there. How would you feel? I remember my, my wife was really, really cool. Uh, um, had a great heart. But I remember one Christmas, it wasn't here, it was in Denver. Uh, and, and of course, you know, Chris, I was the only pastor there. He did all those Christmas services and, and we did a Christmas Day service. And, and then... Um, 
And so I was supposed to go home to open gifts and to have the day with the kids and Janie, right? And somebody's waiting for me. This couple's waiting for me after Christmas Day service, and they need to be counseled, they say. They're having a horrible, no good, very bad day. And, um, and so naturally, I sit down with them, and, and uh, an hour later, the phone rings, and Jane says, very nicely, she says, where are you, you know? And I, and I tell her what's going on, and she says, you know, they can make a stinking appointment for next week, <laughs> right? Because you need to be home with your kids. Now, she wasn't down on me, but that must have been how the disciples felt, you think? We have been giving of ourselves all of that time, and we need a little time with Jesus. We go across the lake to get it, and the crowds are there. But that's not how Jesus responded. He remembered who the real enemy was. And he had compassion on these people. He, uh, Spoligno, he hurt within himself for these people because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began teaching them many things. Remember, everything flows from his word. It wasn't just about teaching them. It was about the power that comes from his word to, 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 to heal and restore. Disciples said, send the people away. James said, send them away. You know? <laughs> Disciples, uh, Jesus said this, you give them something to eat. You know the rest of the story, the miracle that happened. To me, this is the crux of it. Send the people away. You give them something to eat. Got a question for you. Who's the real enemy here? The disciples thought the people were the enemy. You ever turn people into your enemy? It's so easy because sometimes they're like leeches and suck you dry, right? Sometimes they do horrible things and they hurt you, right? Sometimes it's like they're possessed by what is evil, right? How often do we turn people into enemies? And to remember, as opposed to remembering who the real enemy is. Around here we talk about sharing life, creating friendships, and inspiring hope. We notice we have three points. Because you see, as we live our lives as followers of Jesus, we call people to repent, we share life. We call people to this life in Jesus. We do relationships, remind them who we are, who Jesus is, who they are in him, right? And we're out in the community feeding people the good things of this world and of God. It's all bound together. It's a whole fabric. It's, it's one and the same. When we go out to acres of hope and, and we help out there, Whatever we do, we're pushing back the evil and we're empowered by his word. That's what th this feeding of th this telling his, his him, I'm sorry, Jesus telling his disciples to give them something to eat. This was something that was not non-spiritual. This was part and parcel with pushing back evil. This is part and parcel with, with proclaiming in word and deed that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he had power over darkness. It's all in the one. It's, it's all together and it's always, always move forward, move forward because the spirit of God by his word touches our hearts and through us, touches the hearts of those around us. And they all ate and were satisfied. Such is the miracle of Jesus Christ. So, you know, I don't know why they didn't. Uh, I, I looked at this. I thought, man, I wish I could stop here. I wish the chapter would be over. But, but it goes on, and it goes on with an immediately. So, so Jesus didn't let it end there. In fact, immediately something was happening. Something that Jesus had to get done right now. It, it's, 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 it's immediately he got his disciples in a boat and they went on ahead of him to Bethsaida. So they went across the lake immediately and he, was, he went somewhere else to pray. And he was orchestrating something here. 
And so they got into like a storm. They couldn't get through. Go ahead. Uh, and and he, he was walking to them on the water, and they were freaking frightened, right? And they said immediately he spoke to them and said, take courage and desire. Do not be afraid. And ask yourself the question, what is he trying to do, and why is he trying to do it? What aren't they getting? Why is this added in this chapter? What's going on here? And right away, this is what it says. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. Read the rest of it with me. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. They hadn't understood about who the real enemy was. They hadn't understood that Jesus Christ was the King of kings and Lord of lords. They hadn't understood that they were sent out in his name. They hadn't gotten the picture. They had somehow gone by them. They had missed it. And so Jesus used this crisis that he brought into their lives so they could see it and receive it. Where is that place in your life that is a crisis right now? Right there is where the Spirit of Christ is touching your heart with who the real enemy is, who he is, and who you are. Right there is where he's putting it all together for you. So you can have the light go on and live in it. He calls us knowing who the enemy is, real enemy is, to know who Jesus is and to know who we are. Life with Jesus. Remember who the real enemy is. Remember who Jesus is. Remember who you are. Will you pray with me? Dear Jesus, we thank you that uh, through the pen of Mark, uh, your spirit gave us these words today. Um, they're such a blessing to us because you, you put everything into focus. Remind us every day uh, who the real enemy is and, and who you are, that you have victory over this enemy, that you have sent us out, that we are your own dear children, sons and daughters of the king, empowered, redeemed, restored, Show us, Lord, uh, remind us, empower us to live in this for the good of those uh, in our world who, who are struggling so in this brokenness to know you and, and to be touched by your goodness. We pray in your name and all God's people say, amen. Uh, a time of prayer, a time of prayer for um, uh, God's people and all the people gathered together. Um, we have a God who speaks to us through his word and a God who invites us to talk back to him, to speak back to him the things that are on our heart. If you personally would like to have a prayer with someone, uh, we have prayer partners that are at the prayer banners. Uh, they'll be there during communion. They'll be there after the service. Uh, another way you can share with us, uh, if you're joining us online, is send the prayer requests in. Uh, mail us here at church, and we'd love to join you in praying for those things. Or you can, uh, if you're here in person, write it on uh, the connection card. And let us know those prayer requests, and we'd love to join you in praying. Uh, we come before our God now in this time of prayer, praying that God would be with us, that he would bless us, that he would speak to our hearts. Lord, pour your spirit out upon us. Help us to speak your words of hope in our homes, to our family members, to our friends that your message might get out, that your kingdom might move forward. Lord, bless our marriages. Pour out your grace and your love that we may share it with one another and live in your peace. Lord, help us to see the places where we're working and where you're calling us to make a difference for your kingdom beyond the walls of our church. Lord, you are the great physician. We ask that you would hear our prayers on behalf of all your servants who are suffering, Tim, Jerry, Danny, and Jacob. Do not let them lose heart. Heal them. Help them to fix their eyes on Jesus. Lord Jesus, you conquered the grave. You are the resurrection and the life. And so, Lord, comfort those who mourn, especially the family and friends of Wes and Jan. Assure them of the hope of the resurrection to life everlasting. Faithful Lord, when the storms come in our lives, 
Help us not to lose faith, but strip away the things that would blind us, that would block our vision from looking to you, seeing you as our Lord and our Savior. Help us to know and to trust that you are who you say you are and you can accomplish more than we would ask and imagine. Lord, revive us with your spirit. Empower us as your children that we may follow you in all we do. We pray this, trusting in Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As God's people uh, together, uh, we sing about our faith, our, our faith given to us by his spirit, communicated to us by his word. Uh, we sing that in the words of the song, This I Believe. Let's all stand together.
worship, when we come to our God, when we come to receive what he would have to give to us, and that is his body and blood broken and shed for us so that we would know for certain that we are forgiven, that we are loved, that we are his chosen people, and that he loves us and forgives us. And so that we would know that he instituted this meal that we share together to receive his grace. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave to them all, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may be seated. Uh, you'll be dismissed to come forward and receive communion. After you've received uh, the bread and the wine, you can return to your seats, and uh, we'll do a general dismissal for everyone.
this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Strengthen and preserve you, body and soul, unto life everlasting. Depart in his peace. Amen. You know, there's something uh, really incredible in uh, Mark chapter 6 that, that Pastor Brad skipped over that just caught me by go- off guard. And uh, it's right after uh, Jesus says to them, after the disciples say, no, send them away. We don't want to deal with them anymore says to them, but you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take more than a half of year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? Are we to go spend that much? In other words, they've got the money. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. Here they are walking around with Jesus, the king of creation, the one who feeds 5,000 with uh, just a little bit of food, and they've got a big bag of money. They're worried about worldly things, about uh, things that they can hold on to with their hands. And in some ways, maybe they're looking to that. Here, as we come in a moment of offering, it's our opportunity to say, God, you're the one that we really trust. Move my heart from the things that I can hold on to with my hands into the God who holds on to me with his nail-pierced hands. And so we come before our God in this moment and recognize that it's not what we can hold on to that's going to save us, that, that holds all of our future in its hands, but it's rather our Savior, Jesus. So I invite you to wor- join me in a word of prayer uh, here in a moment. There's a couple of ways you can give. Uh, you can give online by going to stmatthewrockland.com slash give. You can text uh, mobily St. Matthew Rockland to 833-815-8773. Uh, or you can give in person. We've got boxes back by the doors on the way out, and we've got a, a mailbox out front uh, that is just for offerings. Uh, so join me in a word of prayer as we pray that God would bless uh, these offerings and us in our following of our Savior. Dear Jesus, we come before you, recognizing that you hold all things in your hands. 
Lord, we ask that you would help us to trust in you, the one who holds our lives, our futures, the one who is the giver of all good gifts. Help us to trust in you instead of created things. And Lord, we ask that this day you would take these offerings, that you would multiply them for your kingdom, that you would translate them into more people believing and trusting in you and your power and your grace. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. A couple of announcements for you as we, we close today. Today, right after the service, we're having a greeter meeting. Uh, I'm seeing new faces all the time, which is really cool. And uh, time and time again, I'm told that people are, are welcomed here as they come uh, to be part of this community or just to check it out. And if you'd like to be part of that team of, of welcoming people, we'd love to tell you a little bit more about what that's about. You can join uh, that meeting today at, at 11.30 or on Tuesday at 2 p.m., uh, we'd love to have you be a part of that. Uh, another thing uh, which is coming up is Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday is March 2nd. That is a Wednesday, if I've got my calendar right, uh, and that is at 12 noon that day and 7 p.m. Uh, we'll have our Ash Wednesday service that marks uh, the season, the beginning of the season of Lent, uh, a time when we journey together towards the cross and towards the tomb and the empty tomb and Jesus' resurrection. And so it's a very important time. It'll be a, a wonderful service uh, and we want you to be a part of that. And then there was one other thing. Oh, yeah, the congregational survey. The congregational survey is out there. Uh, it'll be mailed out today. Uh, we'd love to have you take a moment, fill that out. Uh, let us know uh, where you're at on some stuff. With that, I invite you to stand for our closing song and a uh, word of God's peace. May you know the love of the Father that is poured out in his son Jesus, that walks with you, goes with you wherever you go. And may you be empowered by his spirit to walk in grace and love, the grace and love of the Father and our Savior Jesus. Amen. Go in his peace. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn face toward you and give you peace. We're just going to sing amen together. Let's sing. God bless you. You are dismissed.